It's episode 67 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Find all the archives to all of the episodes of Author Stories at hankgarner.com. I'm very pleased to bring you not only the great author interviews that we have each and every week, uh, but also doing this show gives me the chance to bring you some breaking news and some more in-depth coverage of current events like today's show. Michael Bunker joins me on the show to talk about his experience with optioning the film rights to his novel Pennsylvania. I've added a link in the show notes where you can go purchase a copy of Pennsylvania from Amazon.com. Show Michael some love for the great book that he's written. And if you use our link, then the show earns a small commission on that, which allows us to keep bringing you quality content, up-to-date information, and as always, great author interviews. Now on to our show with Michael Bunker. Thanks again for joining me for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to bring you this supplemental episode of the Author Stories Podcast, as we do from time to time, when, when there's news that needs to be broken or uh, special topics that need to be discussed. And uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy to have uh, uh, Michael Bunker on the show with me today. Michael is no... Stranger to the Author Stories podcast. As a matter of fact, he was the very first interview that I recorded for this, even though he was episode two. Uh, I had already scheduled with Jason Gurley, uh, and our, our scheduling got mixed up. So Jason was one, Michael was two, but Michael was actually the first interview that I recorded for this show. And uh, and has been a faithful friend uh, to the Author Stories podcast ever since. And uh, I would just like to welcome Michael to the show today. And Michael's got some... Uh, really awesome news to share, and we're going to get into it and talk about how this news of his uh, maybe affects you uh, as an indie author or as an author in general uh, or as a lover of literature. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, Hank. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> I always consider myself number one in your show. Oh, yeah, I consider and, you number uh, one. Even if I'm number two, I, <laughs> I, I consider myself number one. That's right. That's right. Always glad to be back. Well, thank you, and uh, let's let's just jump straight to it. So yesterday, we're recording this Friday, uh, November the 6th, and yesterday, November the 5th, uh, Variety Magazine uh, dropped this uh, story that uh, kind of uh, took off like, like blazes. Uh, what What is this news? Um, as of, well, it's actually beneficial for uh, a few days longer than that, but as of this week... Um, the Pennsylvania Omnibus, my novel, a sci-fi Amish sci-fi novel, has been um, optioned by Jorgensen Pictures in Hollywood uh, for a a screen project, and we're not exactly sure right now whether that's going to be a uh, a film or a TV series. We're kind of looking at it in both directions, but um, that was announced uh, yesterday in Variety of all places, which was very exciting. Very exciting. Uh, so I'm I'm pretty sure most people are familiar uh, with uh, with Pennsylvania and that project, but let's let's just run over that again real quick. So you wrote uh, this book, I guess, starting almost two years ago when you started on it. It actually was the end of um, end of thirteen. End of thirteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it had to be. I don't know. They all run together, but it, yeah, it was the end of the year. It was actually when we were writing. Me and Chris A. What we're writing the Wick series. Okay. And uh, during the breaks between the parts, we put that out in uh, four parts that were all novel length. And during the breaks between the releases of those parts, I was writing some short stories, primarily uh, to read to my children. And I had written a short story uh, called Futurity, which I'm actually extending out into a novel right now to hope and hoping to release next year. And uh, during one of the breaks, I believe it may have been uh, early uh, 2014 in January, I wrote a little short story, um, maybe 24,000 words, uh, that I just called Pennsylvania. And it was, I mainly wrote it for my children, didn't have much expectation. Um, like you know, indie authors, we 
we we want to experiment with what people might be interested in reading and at the same time i was learning that it's good to have more of a uh, a uh, backlist of yeah. titles that are available and so at the time i had uh, uh the last pilgrim's novel was out was coming out uh, and I had uh, the Futurity uh, story had, had come out, and so and I was writing a uh, another little short story, so I wanted to have more of a backlist, um, and I, I was also looking at kind of like a litmus test. I wanted to know, you know, if this was something, this was like a weird thing for me doing an Amish sci-fi story, to see if it was something that might resonate with people. So I wrote this little short story, and put it out, and. Uh, at first, it didn't do. Uh, it wasn't gangbusters. It, it's. I think we sold 157 copies in the first month, and um, but slowly over that spring and early summer, it really, really started to get traction, and a lot of people uh, were reading it. And so I hadn't written the second part. I hadn't even intended on writing the second part. I did have an overall uh, mythology that I knew that if I ever got back to it, I wanted to include. But I went to uh, Worldcon that summer and met up with Hugh Howie, and we got talking, and he said, you really, really need to do something with this Pennsylvania story. People really like it. And he was introducing me uh, around Worldcon as this Amish science fiction writer. <laughs> so um, I had a laugh <laughs> with that, too. And so I, uh, I decided, you know, when I got home from that Worldcon that I wanted to, to knock it out. So I put out parts uh, two through five. Uh, pretty quickly before, uh, you know, in the next couple of months. And um, I think we are a year off. I think it was the end of 2012. Was it? Okay. And I think it was uh, because I think I went to Worldcon in 2013. And uh, uh, I could be a year off. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it kind of runs together. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, and, and I, I, I think it was because in 2014, April, is when I put out the Omnibus Edition, which really, really did well. It took off, and it was doing gangbusters all summer. And then uh, Amazon picked it up as a Kindle Daily Deal. Uh, I got a book bub on it, and uh, sometime around this time last year, um, it uh, went to number 16 on all of Amazon.com. So it was really, really an exciting time. And um, the story really did resonate with a lot of people. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the beginning of it. There... There's a couple of things I want to ask you about that. Uh, number one, isn't it crazy where the uh, the strangest place places that ideas come from that that you don't put an awful lot of stock in in the beginning, but just really connects with people? That is uh, that that never ceases to amaze me. Uh, you know this this idea that that you wrote this short story. Uh, Pennsylvania and really didn't have a long-term plan for it and then that's the thing that people just go crazy over um what do you make of um writers that that are professional writers and are doing this for a living and then even we can't predict where the lightning strikes uh sometimes it's funny you know, you it's, know, funny, it's uh, crazy yeah uh, you know i at the time uh, i had everything invested in wick Mm -hmm. which was this massive Russian style and length novel um, that I really thought uh, at the time, you know, everybody really the beginning of the kind of apocalyptic fervor. And I just really thought that thing was just going to take off and, and uh, I had all the dreams of movies and all the other stuff. And then there, I, you know, during the break, I wrote this little story that I kind of did as an offhand little story for my children. But, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, by, I'm by actually, the, by the way, ahead. By the way, that's what Wick sounds like when it hits your desk. But, yeah, it's <laughs> heavy. It's good to uh, keep the door open. There are a lot of things you can do with that book. Yeah, but uh, you know, I, right now I'm actually learning how to write a screenplay because I've been asked to write the at least the draft screenplay of Pennsylvania. And um, our good friend Nick Cole told me, you know, you need to get this book called uh, Adventures in the Screen Trade by William Goldman. He's the guy who wrote uh, Princess Bride. And did all types of screenplays. Now this book is uh, came out in '82, so it's 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 an old book, but it has a lot of really really good little tidbits and knowledge about the industry. And as I was reading um, the book, uh, the very the the whole point of the whole book, which he hits on at the very beginning, is no one knows anything. 
<laughs> and they don't know anything in publishing, and they don't know anything in um, in Hollywood. No one knows what is going to be something people are going to like. Uh, they all think they know, and they never do know. And so there have been projects that you, you, you scratch your head. Why hasn't this been made into a movie? Everybody would love it. And then there are projects that you're watching it on the screen. You go like, who in the world gave this thing a go? <laughs> And then, and then you find something that just happens to resonate in the zeitgeist at the time, and 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 it's what people really, really want to see. And so, um, you know, I've written a lot about that kind of stuff. You know, there, there's a book out there. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's called A Confederacy of Dunces. Yes. And uh, it's one of the funniest books that I've ever read. And you know, they've been trying to make that book into a movie for 30 years or 25 years, with some pretty big name uh, talent attached to it. And it's and it's never been made. And then you know you have uh, something like uh, Hunger Games or something, which you know it, it just happens to at, at a specific point in time just actually actually explodes and it has to be made. And uh, so you just never do know. And 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 like William Goldman says, no one knows anything. <laughs> so that's a that's a very encouraging word for all the. <laughs> The struggling artist out there. Nobody knows right. anything. Just just keep your head down and, and keep at it. Um, well, yeah, what you have to do is you have to write what you want to write. And yeah. you have to write it and do it as, as well as you can do it. And work as hard as you can to get it out there. Work as hard as you can to get reviews. And, 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 and then everything else just has to happen. And that you have no control over whatsoever. So, so you write the the first story, and then you get the prodding from Hugh Howey and some other folks, and you decide to flesh it out as a novel. Uh, the The novel <laughs> is received extremely well. Last year has a, a run up the charts. Uh, everything is wonderful. Uh, that was a year ago. What happens between then and uh, this announcement that that now there's a film deal? I, I think a lot of people probably expect things to happen rapidly and and i guess in the uh, it, with the long view this did happen rapidly uh but i think a lot of people would get discouraged <coughs> and and not uh not want to stick with it you know we, we've got a right. lot of there's a there's this tendency now that things have to happen immediately or you know, i'm going to move on to the next thing talk just a little bit about uh the mindset of longevity and uh, and keeping the long view of things, and even though it, and between then and now, uh, you had another big release with Brother Frankenstein. Um, so you know Pennsylvania kind of drops out of the uh, the immediate view. So what what is happening in the background that that Pennsylvania gets picked up and and gets well, moved forward? This is the, uh, the the thing that we're talking about. No one knows anything, and. Uh, you know, in, uh, in the end of 2014, October, November, right around this time a year ago, Pennsylvania yeah. was was really uh, all the rage. And uh, because of Pennsylvania and the success of it, I ended up getting a, a publishing uh, agent, a literary agent. And, you know, of course, in my mind, as many copies as we're selling, it's uh, in the top 20 of all of Amazon.com. Surely someone's going to pick this up for at least a publishing deal. And, uh, you know, I absolutely expected that to happen. But, you know, uh, nobody in the industry knows anything. And so I heard from different agents. I heard from an uh, agent through another person that, you know, if a, if a indie novel hasn't sold 40,000 copies, they don't even want to talk about it and they don't want to look at it. And then I heard from somebody else uh, from an agent that said, if it's sold 40,000 copies, they feel like it might have ex- exhausted its audience and they don't want to look at it. Good. And uh, at the time, my uh, agent who's Jeff Jarek at uh, the G agency. And he was shopping around and we were hearing from publishers. They, they didn't know what the audience would be for Amish sci-fi. They don't have a clue. And we had sold a tremendous number of copies and, and they were concerned that maybe it had exhausted its audience, which I thought was ridiculous and, and, and silly. And so, uh, you know, I kept going and, and wrote brother Frankenstein released that and the same day, a year later, April 29th of, of this year, and uh, had a fantastic cover. Oh yeah! And I think the story is probably the best thing I've ever written. Um, it was uh, highly reviewed by everybody. It still has a 4.8 uh, review rating with over 200 reviews or close to 200 reviews on Amazon.com. Great. Like Wick, I thought this thing is, and, it, and it's 
when you read it, it reads as as a movie. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I was really kind of thinking, OK, you know, Pennsylvania just kind of fizzled a little bit. And but, you know, within a month, Pennsylvania was still out selling Brother Frankenstein. And uh, and I thought that was strange. And so, you know, you get inquiries every once in a while. We had inquiries for foreign rights. We had some inquiries for um, other deals uh, involving uh, Pennsylvania. Back, uh, this had to have been 2013 when I first wrote Futurity. You know, I had a uh, Hollywood guy email me to ask about perhaps, you know, uh, looking into getting an option for it. But it, it just... That whole situation was really weird, <clears throat> and and it just didn't look right to me. I, at the time, I didn't have an agent, so I just really didn't let it go anywhere. Well, um, so I'm, I'm going through the summer this past summer and uh, considering what I need to do next. I, I mean, Pennsylvania was obviously written as the first book in a long trilogy, so I have Oklahoma, which is the second book that I need to write. Um, I'm trying to finish uh, Futurity as a full novel. And uh, had a couple of other projects that were going. Uh, writing another book with Nick Cole and um, uh, Le- Legendarium Two coming out with uh, with Kevin Summers, which I'm excited about. And yeah, and uh, I w- uh, went on a trip with uh, the family up to uh, Missouri to visit some friends, and or go- was gone about a week. And when I came home, you know, there was a stack of mail, and I'm going through the mail, and there's this very very nice, um, almost like like a greeting card, a very expensive type of greeting card. And it, it's from Hollywood, California. And I open it up and it's from uh, Stacy Jorgensen at Jorgensen Pictures. And it just basically was a thank you for writing the book. I thought it was wonderful. And uh, if you are you know, ever interested in selling the option, I'd like to talk to you about it, <laughs> which kind of blew me away, you know. And yeah. I, I actually just took, took my phone and took a picture of her business card. <laughs> and send it to my agent. Pardon me. Let me take a little drink of water. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and and kind of almost forgot about it. You know, I just thought, well, here's another thing that may or may not happen someday. And and uh, very 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 quickly, uh, we both, me and my agent, determined that she was uh, very serious about it. She this was uh, she was a hundred percent sold out on the product. And. Uh, I just wrote a, a blog article that I put out today. People can read it at michaelbunker.com called uh, uh, Selling an Option 101 or something like that. And, uh, you know, um, there's different types of people that buy film options. And you, you can have, you know, your big high power millionaire uh, directors or producers like uh, Ridley Scott or Scorsese or somebody. They go out and buy a lot of properties. They buy a lot of options most of those you know, are not going to ever be made they're trying to kind of cover their bases they're like everyone else they don't know anything and they're putting their their thumb on the uh, pulse and they're trying to figure out what might be hot next and everybody every author was like oh i would love to have an option you know bought by ridley scott or something it happened uh, for andy weir with the martian oh yeah and uh, and it, that was very very successful for him but it's it's very rare too um and you have people who basically work for production companies or studios buying options um and and it's almost like a, a backlist they want to keep them they don't want anybody else to make them but they might want to make it if something happens in the in the culture that that they have this property they can make and then you have people like uh, stacy who she's been in quite a few movies uh as an actor she's produced a couple and 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 done some tv stuff and she's started a company as a uh, uh, a motion picture company, and she's just sold out on this this book. She just thinks that this book needs to get made, and she she likes it as much as I do. And that's uh, why I immediately said, "Yeah, I want to I want to uh, do this," um, because I think that she's uh, the kind of person that goes out there and gets things done. So uh, it, that began a long road because. You know, uh, you can have all the goodwill and good feelings in the world, but when you get agents and lawyers involved, oh, yeah. um, everything grind, grinds to a stop. And so we actually had agreed in principles, you know, sometime in October. And I knew it was coming down the road, but um, you get into very, very minuscule parts of language that have to be changed. And lawyers want to add this and add that. And everybody's looking out for their own uh, 
best interest. And so it takes a long time. Well, um, Stacy was very interested in pitching uh, Pennsylvania at Amer- uh, the American film market, which is going on right now. And it's like one of the biggest film conventions in Hollywood. And so we had, we kind of came up against a, a time wall this past weekend where we just had to get this thing done. And so um, we were able to get it done and that was exciting. And then, you know, to actually get it in variety, which is uh, no uh, small attack. Yeah. And, uh, and to have it as an exclusive was just huge and huge. And, and, and we're very excited about um, everything that's going on right now. So what was the reaction of your agent when you snap a <laughs> photo of this card and, and send it to him? What, what happened then? Well, you know, I, I share an agent with Nick Cole, and right. I, I know, and I listen to your show, and he's been on here, and he's talked a little bit about our agent. Right. He's, a, um, <laughs> he's an very, interesting character. He's an interesting character. He's very uh, um, old school. He's, uh, although he, he, he's willing to uh, deal with me as an indie, and I think that's wonderful, uh, but he's uh, kind of a cynical New Yorker, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, he uh, uh, can come across as kind of a scowling negativist. And so, you know, you, you got emails going back. It's like, oh, you know, we'll talk to her. But, you know, there's just, you know, she's small time or whatever, you know, it, whatever negatives he can come up with. And then, um, you know, th- there's a different, as you know, in, in publishing, there's a really different attitude between indies and the people that have always been mainstream pub. And a lot of the people that are, have come up in that mainstream pub thing, they're very, very old school. They're very uh, unwilling to look at different ways of doing things. And then the indie spirit kind of is like, uh, we all write uh, without a contract. <laughs> we all, we all write hoping good things are going to happen. We're very hopeful and uh, we're willing to put our work out there and then hope. And that same uh, spirit is true in the film industry. You have the kind of the old stoic, old film people. Then you have uh, a lot of new uh, indie uh, producers and, and companies that uh, they want to c- come up with new ways of doing things. And so uh, there was kind of this clash of worlds. I'm here in Central Texas. Uh, Jeff, uh, my agent, is in New York City, and Stacy Jorgensen is in Hollywood. And we're all talking about this thing. And and, uh, and so it took a little work to get it. You know, uh, my agent was uh, wonderful through the whole thing. He definitely looked out for my interest uh, we talked about a lot of his own experience because he sold a few TV and film deals, and I learned a lot from talking to him about you know things you need to watch out for and, and what to do and what not to do. And um, and at the same time, uh, Stacy was very very helpful, and we talked a lot about you know what we want this thing to look like and be like, and and uh, and so we were able to come together. And I think it's uh, it's going to be fun to see if and when something happens. Uh, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago Andy Weir and the phenomenal success of The Martian. Uh, I, my wife and I went to see The Martian, I guess, the week after it opened. Um, uh, have, have you seen the movie? I did. I saw it when it first came out. Yeah, I thought it was incredible. And, of course, there are, yeah, there are elements of the book that did not make it to the screen. Uh, but I think the spirit of the book is there, definitely. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I heard some people kind of fuss a little bit about, well, they left out pirate ninjas and, you know, some right. other things that, you know, and it, my wife had not read the book and she thought the movie was amazing and fascinating and, and, you know, yeah. all this stuff. And so did I. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so now we've got Andy, we've got A.G. Riddle, who uh, has sold uh, film right. options to two of his books. Uh, we've got Hugh, who has sold... Uh, options to Ridley Scott, um, and I, I know there are. Uh, I know Matthew Mather has uh, sold some options to right. uh, one or two of his, and and I know there's a half dozen other that I'm just uh, not grabbing off the top of my head. What what do you think? Um, or do you think that the the establishment is uh, starting to take notice of indies, or do you think that uh, uh, that that some indies have just kind of broken through that barrier and now uh, have, I, I guess what I'm saying is, do you think they're paying more attention to indies or do you think that indies have just finally reached a place where we are as competitive as everyone else? I think both of those things are true uh, at some level. Um, 
I, you know, the film industry is what it is, and nobody's going to do anything don't think that it will make money. Um, of course, most things don't make money, but they're operating on the assumption that they think it's going to make money. And so they look at it through that lens, and I think they are uh, uh, discovering that the more there are more good quality indie books out there. And uh, the thing that uh, I discussed with uh, Stacy Jorgensen was um, a lot, because of the way that the publish industry works in the mainstream side of it, uh, a lot of stories get published because they're like something else or because they're like what agents think everybody wants. And so um, very quickly having uh, an agent uh, submit books to a publishing house, you get this feedback and it's like, well, it needs to have more of this or we don't think anybody's going to like that. And, you know, with Pennsylvania, that was one of the things they said was, you know, we don't know if anybody wants uh, Amish science fiction. And so I think that because of that uh, environment, the books that are coming out are a lot, they're all alike. And I think it, um, uh, the film people are starting to see that if they do want something that's unique, that's different, that maybe hits a different chord, that uh, they are looking uh, on the indie side. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a lot to be said about that. And I think there's going to be more of that in the future. Uh, I called it kind of a land rush after The Martian uh, because it actually got made. Um, a lot of people were watching Wool, and you know, Wool's been uh, kind of floating out there for a couple of years now. Right. But the, the Martian was made very quickly. And, and so, made well. Um, and made, it made very well. And that's one thing I wanted to mention based on your comments was the movie and the book are really two different things. Yeah. And I'm learning this really, really up front and close right now. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why I believe and I think, you know, our, our initial position with is that it, it needs to be a TV series because the world is so big that a movie would have to be such a shell of the book. There are books that are made for movies like Brother Frankenstein is, is really made to be a full uh, length feature. Yeah. But Pennsylvania, as we know, there are over 20 writers that have written short stories and novels in that world. There's a lot of fanfic. There's a, it's just a very, very broad world, um, and, and we think it's going to be better for TV. And as uh, I sat down to start thinking about screenplay, and I'm trying to learn about all this, uh, you just cannot take the book and, and make it into uh, a movie or into a TV show because, first of all, it would have to be so long it would, and nobody would watch it. But, you know, <laughs> to give you an example with Pennsylvania, uh, one of the things that really attracted Stacy to the project was that there was these there, there were these two very, very disparate but very interesting elements, and that is the kind of the idyllic Amish life, which a lot of people don't know about. They only see it in pictures. Yeah. And then there was this high-tech, war excitement action part of the, the story and she wants to see both of those things reflected in uh whatever we we put on the screen and so when you, when you actually go read the book you have these very long scenes where it's one or the other and um yeah there there are you know long periods of of discussion dialogue exposition whatever and so you might if you tried to film that you would have long sections that <laughs> would actually be boring, either either of one or the other. Right. And so right. you you really have to look at the story and say, okay, this is the shell of a story we want to tell, and how can we do that and keep both of these elements really evenly evenly balanced? And so it it requires introducing new scenes. It requires deleting or cutting uh, some scenes, uh, and we're hoping that we come up with something that, that people really, really want to watch and to continue watching. Now, you mentioned uh, the world of, of New Pennsylvania, uh, that that you uh, did this uh, this kind of groundbreaking thing by, by opening up your world and, uh, and inviting people to write in it. Uh, well, I, I think originally people asked you if they could, and, and you just said, sure, go ahead. But, right. Um, and then you've got the the collection uh, of short stories, tales from Pennsylvania, uh, but you know several other books. Uh, uh, Chris Porto uh, comes immediately to mind with his uh, uh, B Company stories right. uh, that it, that expounded on that, and and several others as well. Um, but as you're writing this and you are bringing this to a visual medium, uh, do you 
do you think in terms of this expanded universe that other people have helped uh, create? Do, do those uh, factors come in, and do you think they're uh, – it, especially if this becomes a TV series, uh, I think you're absolutely right. The uh, expansiveness of this is really uh, – I, I think it deserves to be on TV, and, and good TV the way – Game of Thrones and some of those others are, are really upping the production value. Uh, but right. do you do you see the opportunity for this whole big expanded universe to to really be fleshed out? Yeah, I think so. And I'm not personally, you know, right now we're, we're writing the the pilot or you know an hour and a half or two hour film. Yeah, uh, this could all change because if it ends up getting picked up as a feature film, then of course we'll have to change everything. But right now we're kind of assuming. <laughs> That, that this is going to be a, a long, a one-hour or two-hour pilot. Um, and so, you know, right now I'm, I'm really focused on getting uh, the Pennsylvania story established and have enough excitement and enough uh, really uh, interesting elements in it that people want to watch it. But that's one of the things that we're all uh, excited about, about the series as a whole, is that there are so many different ways to go. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the reality of it is, you know, a lot of things can happen. You know, if if this ends up getting picked up by a big studio, they could, uh, you know, kick me off of it and, and make their own thing. Pennsylvania could be about monkeys dancing a sideshow. You know, I don't <laughs> you don't have any real control after you've sold it. But, uh, you know, right uh, right now, though, uh, as it stands at the, as, as we record this, I am writing the uh, original draft screenplay. And so that's kind of the vision of it is to. You know, we see a lot of elements. It, it has a lot of the elements of Lost. Um, <clears throat> you're on a diff- different planet, but you don't know exactly where or when that planet is. Uh, there's a lot of very uh, kind of what the heck moments uh, that that happen uh, throughout the story. Uh, there's uh, some time travel elements and all of this, and so I think we have the benefits of what made Lost good without the elements of what made it bad. But <laughs> at the end. But then um, we also, there's a lot of elements of shows like Jericho that became very cult favorites where you have, you know, group, a group of people in a, in a new environment that are, that are trying to just make it, trying to survive. And there's a lot of that action and all of that involved in it. So I think, uh, I think there are a lot of good things to work with. And then, you know, Lord willing, if this thing were to get picked up and, um, and you end up, you know, going, you know, five or six seasons with it. There are so many awesome elements to the overall mythology of Pennsylvania that will just make riveting TV. And so uh, I think we all see that. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm really, really hoping it goes that way. I, I just want to know if the prop department is going to get the coffee can right. <laughs> well, <laughs> you got to hope. You got to hope. But it, it is in uh, one of the opening scenes of our uh, draft screenplay. So. And, and it should and, be. Yeah, and it, and it figures in the story. So, yeah, you got to hope they get stuff like that right. Of course, everybody has in their mind's eye what kind of coffee it is. So, I'm a, right. <laughs> I don't Right. <laughs> well, it's a metal coffee <coughs> can. So, you know, that narrows it down, or at least, it, you know. Right. Uh, anyway, anyway, that's for those of you that have read Pennsylvania, that makes perfect sense. And, <laughs> you know, anyway. Um, so, uh, so where do you go from here? You're you're beginning to to write this uh, this initial draft. Uh, it, it sounds like there's uh, it, it's a big time in Hollywood right now where things are getting shopped. Uh, do you, uh, like what kind of time frame do you hope to have a draft ready and, and you guys to start shopping that around? You know, we could have a draft ready uh, fairly quickly. Uh, you know, six to eight weeks. I think uh, we could have that ready. Uh, you know, parts of that can be shopped around immediately. We've already finished. Uh, the first uh, section of the draft screenplay, and we're working pretty quickly on that. Um, what happens next, there's really two elements to it. There's the creative side, which is I'm actually working with uh, our friend Forbes West, who has some experience both with film and uh, screenplay writing. And, oh, yeah. And uh, he's helping me with the screenplay. And so we're bouncing ideas off each other and, and, and going through the whole creative process of putting together a draft screenplay. At the same time, uh, Stacy Jorgensen with Jorgensen Pictures is uh, really kind of doing the work almost of a film agent in that she is uh, she's shopping the product and she has uh, a package put together and 
uh, getting it in variety was a part of that. Um, talking to uh, production companies and studios and trying to find a partner. Uh, there's many different ways it can go from there. Uh, she could uh, hook up with a, a partner that uh, has the same vision and that wants to uh, uh, move forward with us kind of how we have it originally planned. She could hook up with a partner that doesn't want us to have anything to do with it and kicks us all off the project and, and buys it. Um, also, uh, uh, she is a production company and she, she makes movies. So if, uh, if it got to that, she's willing to, uh, to make the thing herself. So that would involve, uh, the finance a- end of, of making movies, which is a big portion of it. Yeah. And that is getting the funds to, to make the movie or to make the, make the, the pilot. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. The option is for one year and, but that can be extended for, um, another year period and then another year period after that. So sometimes these things can take a long time to get done and sometimes they can happen pretty quickly if they, if things go right. So we're just hopeful and we're going to try to do everything we can to help and to make it the best uh, we can make it. In the very cynical uh, times uh, and especially in a cynical industry like entertainment, uh, how refreshing is it to have someone from a production company that's that excited about a project and comes to you uh with that sort of excitement that that has to uh you know lend some some energy and some juice to the whole process it really does and you know back in my pre-plane days back when i was uh uh, living as a regular englisher and i was uh in sales you know there is a very cynical worldview out there people that don't love their work and they're just going through the motions and they're trying to make money and they're trying to make things happen and so it was very exciting to to uh, talk to somebody who was that sold out on the product uh to the point where she really kind of cleared her plate and made this first and you know there's a difference um in us because i'm i'm a writer i'm not in the movie business and this can happen or not happen and it's not going to uh, fundamentally change my my life or anything if it doesn't happen if it dies on the vine you know i'm not uh, in the movie business but this is her career and uh, she's uh, really really sold out on the product and that is an exciting thing and it's rare uh, in that business to find somebody who is so uh, committed to a project so i'm ec- ecstatic uh, to be working with stacy on, on the project so so this is a question for for you uh, uh just for uh, this is for all the writers and the creatives out there. Um, personally, uh, as a as a writer, as a creative person, I, and I know you have so much more going on in your life than, but but you do consider yourself primarily a writer. I think. Right. Um, you, you know, um, what does that do for you when when you sit back and and you say, you know what, uh, someone does appreciate what I do and. Uh, you know, and, and I know we, we don't do it all for, for accolades and whatever, but, um, you know, there I think a, a lot of us uh, struggle and toil, and, and we do appreciate when we get that one review from someone or we get an email that says, man, I read your story, and it just it, it hit me, and, and, you know, I just wanted to share with you how much it meant to me. I mean, those things make a writer's month, yeah, a, a yeah. year, you know. Um, and to, to be on the level where someone says, man, I appreciate your story so much. I want to see this on film so that a, you know, a, a much larger audience can, can share it, uh, I, I think, can, can enjoy it. What, what does that feel like for you? I think all of these things, it's kind of, uh, people don't realize it, but, uh, and you do, but authoring is a really, uh, lonely business. Even when yeah. you have as many friends as we have, it's also very, it can be very dark in that, yeah. um, you are really, uh, putting your work out there and and a lot of times it kind of disappears into the void and some sometimes you you do question whether you have any talent or whether anybody's any ever going to like your work or why uh, things aren't happening and and uh, i can tell you uh, personally i just say this for all the other authors out there 2015 has not been a banner year for me uh 2014 was a really really awesome year professionally but 2015 was not you know uh the launch of brother frankenstein did not go as i'd hoped it would and there were some things that were outside of my control that damaged the launch of the book the book is still in my mind fantastic and probably the best thing i've ever written but um that happens and if you read a lot of literature and you read a lot of history of literature that's happened to a lot of authors 
yeah. where some uh, some uh, kind of uh, gathering of events happens that makes something just not go like you would hope it would go. Uh, <clears throat> William Goldman, Goldman talks about this in the book that I'm reading, where they, they uh, he uses as an example um, the uh, A Bridge Too Far, which was a fantastic movie. Uh, that had Rob Redford and uh, Ryan O'Neill and j- just about everybody was in it. It is one of the best war movies I think that's ever been made, but it, uh, people may not realize that movie was not a hit. It did not do that well. And um, although it did make money because the, it was an indie who made that movie and he paid for it basically out of his pocket and it was already profitable before it ever got uh, got out there just because he sold so many foreign rights to it. But yeah. as far as the actual uh, reception of the movie, uh, it, it was almost a dud. And uh, he goes through the list of everything that was right about the movie. The, the, the power actors they had, the script was fantastic, the reviews were fantastic, pre-release reviews. Uh, the, uh, they actually filmed on, on location in Holland on the real bridges, the bridges, Bridge of Nijmegen and all that. And uh, you can see the quality when you watch the movie, but when it released nothing really happened and as authors we 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 experience that so 2015 for me has not been a great year both personally and uh and professionally and i've kind of almost disappeared a lot from from facebook and the social media just because you know uh, of that it's it's uh sometimes you just get into this position where things are tough and something like this to get back to your question really kind of shows you a light in the darkness that there are people that are affected by your work and that do read it and do uh, come to love it and, and uh, are willing to invest themselves into it heavily. And when that happens, it certainly does give you uh, a lot of uh, satisfaction uh, and, and, and almost kind of can re kick start the engine, which I think we all need it sometime. And, and the other thing is, you know, I've been in a position where I've been uh, congratulating uh, Matthew Mather and AG Riddle and, Andy Weir and Hugh Howey on these things and thinking, man, wouldn't it be great if that ever happened to me? And I'm hoping that um, there are people out there that realize that if you write a good book and you work hard to get it out there and you work hard to harvest reviews, that things can happen. doesn't mean they will, but they can. And uh, that uh, really, really makes it all worthwhile. Well, I I think you and I have a particular worldview uh, as to why things happen uh right and uh you know but i I think for for everyone uh, to keep in mind that you know the movie you talked about is a prime example uh it's thought of as a classic now uh was thought of as a flop then i think there's a lot of films uh that are like that that people wrote off in the beginning uh but then became cult favorites and and all of this stuff and it's this the danger of this short-minded narrow uh, if it doesn't happen now it's never going to happen and and the great thing about indie publishing specifically is once you've published it it's there it, you know it it's available forever <coughs> you That's know true. Um, absolutely and, true you know and you know and uh, i i am not uh down on traditional publishing at all i have a lot of friends in traditional publishing i have a lot of guests on this show in traditional publishing. Um, so I, I'm not about the territorial wars. I, I think whatever s- serves the artist and the, and the reader, uh, is, is the best thing. However you choose to do that, that's, that's your right. business. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing that I think that Indies have, uh, is that we, we do own our art and, and we can make it available into perpetuity. Uh, and we're not subject to the whims of, you know, something being pulled and, and not gone back to print, uh, you know, for whatever reason. So anyway, what I'm saying is that, you know, once you've created the thing and you just have faith and you just trust that, you know, it's going to find its audience one day. It may not be now. It may not have performed the way I wanted it to. Uh, but there are plenty of books, movies, uh, things like that, that eventually found their audience. And, uh, I think just having being able to to take the pressure off of it and say, you know what, um, okay, it didn't do what I wanted it to, but I'm going to have faith and I'm going to trust that it eventually will. Yeah, um, and and also to know that uh, if you keep at it and you keep writing and you keep putting out other works, 
it may not be the one that you think is going to be the one that does that, you know? <laughs> right, um, exactly. And, and like I said, nobody knows anything in the business, and everybody's kind of uh, feeling their ways around in the in the blind. But, uh, you know, for example, and I wrote this in a, the blog post that I put out today, so people can go read it on my, my blog. But um, uh, I, in 2013, I told you I, I was at Worldcon, and um, I went to a uh, film panel. And it was, a, it, I think the title of the panel was How to Sell a Film Option. And, uh, the, you know, the room was filled with an audience and all these people had their pens and their paper out and they were going to write down the steps. Here's how you get it. And I, <clears throat> I didn't think that at all. I thought if there was a way to do it, everybody would do it and it would never work. So there's no right. way to sell a film option. They can tell you how they sold a film option or they can tell you how uh, it has worked in uh, – in different times and eras or whatever, but nobody can tell you how to sell a film option. So I went in there and I was kind of uh, doing more of a sociological study or psychological study. And uh, 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 there was like five or six panelists and every one of them was saying, you know, uh, here's how, here's what happened with me. And there was this common element to all the stories. And that was basically in the mind of the audience, they got lucky. And the lady who was there, that was probably the biggest name on the panel. She had written the, Vamp- Southern vampire mysteries that had uh, been bought and picked up and became True Blood, which I think is an HBO series or something. And uh, she was telling her story and she said, you know, it just happened that this uh, director was getting his hair cut and he had to wait in line. So he had about an hour or 45 minutes. So he walked down to a bookstore, which was on the corner. My book happened to be there, displayed prominently. He bought it. And he immediately called uh, my agent and, and bought the option. Well, the uh, the audience at this uh, panel were just aghast because nobody was telling them how to sell one. They were all saying that in their mind, they got lucky. And so these questions, kind of very uh, passive aggressive questions were coming out like, well, but how do I do it? How do I sell a film option? (laughs) And finally, one of the uh, gentlemen on the panel said, you know, she didn't get lucky. She wrote a good book that somebody picked up and loved and she worked hard to get it published and, sh- and and there was a lot of work that was so the book was there for number one and number two it was there and it was likely somebody was going to like it which means it was a good book those things are not uh easy those things are hard and yeah. so um you know it, it, to constantly keep that in mind in my, in my particular story with pennsylvania uh, and i have never asked uh stacy how she got a hold of the book i need to ask her but i've never asked her you do because that that's a story you need <laughs> it's to part tell. of the story yeah uh, she put on facebook that it was august 10th and she was on an airplane and she was reading the book and she said this is something like i've never read before and she fell in love with the book so you know someone could say well that's lucky you know i i, I look at all the hours and hours and and pain and tears i went in not only to writing the book but promoting the book publishing the book uh, getting the artwork done making sure that it, uh, the thing was as good as I could possibly get it, hiring David Gatewood to uh, edit the thing, getting artwork by uh, Ben Adams, which was fantastic, so that if somebody looked at the book, they love it, and then harvesting reviews, which has been a constant labor of mine for over a year on that book, so that there's, a, I think there's 316 reviews on the book, and most of, most of them are positive. So there was a lot of tremendous amount of work that went into it. And my encouragement to indies out there is, are, is this, and there's several. First of all, continue to work, work hard, make your book as good as you can make it, get it to as many people as you can, and get as many reviews as you can. Uh, the second thing I would say is realize that the industry is changing, and, and most of those changes are good and they're in our favor, both the publishing industry and the film industry. There are more, uh, we're race, basically in a golden era of uh, TV. And everybody is looking for new content. Uh, Netflix is putting out TV shows. Yahoo's putting out TV shows. Hulu's putting out TV shows. Google is putting out TV shows. <laughs> and so <laughs> there's a competition out there for good and in, in, uh, independent work that's different. And so uh, the venue there and in the literary world is growing for people who work hard and are creative and, and try to get it done. So I want everybody to be encouraged. Yeah, and those two things are uh, are important. Work hard and be creative. Uh, and when you don't feel creative, work hard. That's right. <laughs> work harder. <laughs> work harder, you know, uh, because uh, overnight successes rarely are. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know how many musicians you can look at that, that uh, you know, are, are called overnight successes and, and people ignore the, the years and years that they toiled, you know, playing, you know, with an acoustic guitar in a club to five people, uh, you know, just just grinding it out, you know, and the, the right. same thing with authors that, you know, are, are sitting up late at night by lamplight, just, you know, pounding out the stories, hoping that that they connect with with one reader someday right, uh, right. M- much less you know with a uh you know opening on you know 500 screens uh, across america you know right uh, so yeah keep at it for sure yes. um and and uh that new blog post is up at michaelbunker.com yeah it's up there today and uh looks like it's already getting a lot of traffic so uh yeah definitely check it out it has a lot of the details in there about what's going on Awesome. We'll send everybody over to go read it. Uh, Michael, thank you for for being uh, a friend of mine and a friend of authors. And uh, I, I think we are all watching this as closely as we can. Well, it should be fun. And I appreciate you and appreciate all you do uh, for authors and for me as well. <laughs>